Welcome back, everyone. This is part three in our series on distributed word representations. We're going to be talking about vector comparison methods. To try to make this discussion pretty intuitive, I'm going to ground things in this running example. On the left, I have a very small vector space model. We have three words, A, B, and C. And you can imagine that we've measured two dimensions, dx and dy. You could think of them as documents if you wanted. There are two perspectives that you might take on this vector space model. The first is just at the level of raw frequency, B and C seem to be united. They are frequent in both the X and the Y dimension, whereas A is comparatively infrequent along both those dimensions. That's the first perspective. The second perspective, though, is more subtle. You might just observe that if we kind of correct for the overall frequency of the individual words, then it's actually A and B that are united because they both have a bias in some sense for the DY dimension, whereas by comparison, C has a bias for the X dimension, again, thinking proportionally. Both of those are perspectives that we might wanna capture and different notion, notions of distance will key into one or the other of them. One more preliminary, uh, I think it's very intuitive to depict these vector spaces and in only two dimensions, that's pretty easy. You can imagine that this is the DX dimension along the X axis, and this is the DY dimension along the Y axis. And then I have placed these individual points in that plane. And then you can see graphically that B and C are pretty close together, and A is kind of lonely down here in the corner, the infrequent one. Let's start with Euclidean distance, very common notion of distance in these spaces and quite intuitive. We can measure the Euclidean distance between vectors U and V, if they share the same dimension N, by just calculating the sum of the squared element-wide differences, absolute differences, and then taking the square root of that. That's the math here. Let's look at that in terms of this space. So here we have our vector space depicted graphically, A, B, and C, and Euclidean distance is measuring the length of these lines. I've annotated with the full calculations, but the intuition is just that we are measuring the length of these lines, the most direct path between these points in our high dimensional space. And you can see that Euclidean distance is capturing the first perspective that we took on the vector space, which unites the frequent items, B and C, as against the infrequent one, A. As a stepping stone toward cosine distance, which will behave quite differently, let's talk about length normalization. Given a vector u of dimension n, the L2 length of u is the sum of the squared values in that matrix, and then we take the square root. That's our normalization quantity there. And then the actual normalization of that original vector u involves taking each one of its elements and dividing it by that fixed quantity, the L2 length. Let's look, look at what happens to our little illustrative example. On the left here, I have the original count matrix. And in this column here, I've given the L2 length as a quantity. And then when we take the, that quantity and divide each one of the values in that vector to get its L2 norm, you can see that we've done something significant to the space. So they're all kind of united on the same scale here. And A and B are now close together whereas B and C are comparatively far apart. So that is capturing the second perspective we, that we took on the matrix where A and B have something in common as against C. And that has come entirely from the normalization step. And if we measured Euclidean distance in this space, just the length of the lines between these points, we would again be capturing that A and B are alike and B and C are comparatively different. Cosine kind of does that all in one step. So the cosine distance, or approximately the distance, um, as you'll see, between two vectors u and v of dimension, shared dimension n, this calculation has two parts. This is the similarity calculation, cosine similarity, and it is the dot product of the two vectors divided by the product of their L2 lengths. And then to get something like the distance, we just take one and subtract out that similarity. Again, let's ground this in our example. Here we have the original count vector space model. Um, and what we do with cosine distance is essentially measure the angles between these lines that I've drawn from this origin point. And so you can see that cosine distance is capturing the fact that A and B are close together as measured by this angle, whereas B and C are comparatively far apart. So again, with cosine, we're abstracting away from frequency information and keying into that abstract notion of similarity that connects A and B as against C. Another perspective that you could take is just observe that if we first normalize 
the vectors via, via the L2 norm and then apply the cosine calculation. We change the space as I showed you before. So they're all up here kind of on the unit sphere. And notice that the actual values that we get out are the same whether or not we did that L2 norming step. And that is because cosine is building the, L, the effects of L2 norming directly into this normalization here in the denominator. There are a few other methods that we could think about or classes of methods. I think we don't need to get distracted by the details, but I thought I would mention them in case they come up in your reading or research. The first class are what, are, what I've called matching-based methods. They're all kind of based in this matching coefficient. Uh, and then jacquard, dice, and overlap are terms that you might see in the literature. These are often defined only for binary vectors, but here I've given their generalizations to the real valued vectors that we're talking about. And the other class of methods that you might see come up are probabilistic methods, which tend to be grounded in this notion of KL divergence. KL divergence is essentially a way of measuring the distance between two probability distributions uh, between to be more precise, uh, from a reference distribution P to some other probability distribution Q. Um, and it has symmetric notions, symmetric KL, and Jensen-Shannon distance, which is another symmetric notion that's based in KL divergence. Again, these are probably appropriate measures to choose if the quantities that you're thinking of are appropriately thought of as probability values. Now, I've alluded to the fact that the cosine distance measure that I gave you before is not quite what's called a proper distance metric. Let me expand on that a little bit. To qualify as a proper distance metric, a vector comparison method has to have three properties. It needs to be symmetric. That is, it needs to give the same value for x, y as it does to y, x. KL divergence actually fails that first um, rule. It needs to assign zero to identical vectors. And crucially, it needs to satisfy what's called the triangle inequality, which says that the distance between x and z is less than or equal to the distance between x and y and then y to z. Cosine distance, as I showed it to you before, fails to satisfy the triangle inequality. And this is just a simple example that makes it intuitive. It just happens that this distance here is actually greater than these two values here which is a failure of the statement of the triangle inequality. Now, this is relatively easily corrected, but this is also kind of a useful framework. Of all the different choices that we could make, of all the options for vector comparison, suppose we decided to favor the ones that counted as true distance metrics. Then that would at least push us to favor Euclidean distance, Jacquard for binary vectors only, and Jens and Shannon distance if we were talking about probabilistic spaces. And we would further amend the definition of cosine distance to the more careful one that I've given here, which, which satisfies the triangle inequality as well as the other two criteria. And by this kind of way of dividing the world, we would also reject matching jacquard, dice overlap, um, KL divergence, and symmetric KL divergence as ones that failed to be proper distance metrics. And so that might be a useful framework for thinking about choices in this space. One other point in relation to this, this is obviously a more involved calculation than the one that I gave you before. And in truth, it is probably not worth the effort. Here's an example of just a bunch of vectors that I sampled from one of our vector space models. And I've compared the improper cosine distance that I showed you before on the x-axis with the proper cosine dis distance measure that I just showed you. And the correlation between the two is almost perfect. So there is essentially no difference between these two different ways of measuring cosine. And I think that they're probably essentially identical up to ranking, which is often the quantity that we care about when we're doing these comparisons. So probably stick with the simpler and less involved calculation would be my advice. Let's close with some generalizations and relationships. First, Euclidean, as well as Jacquard and Dice with raw count vectors will tend to favor raw frequency over other distributional patterns, like that more abstract one that I showed you um, with our illustrative example. Euclidean with L2 norm vectors is equivalent to cosine when it comes to ranking, which is just to say that if you wanna use Euclidean and you first L2 norm your vectors, you're probably do, doing something that might as well just be the cosine calculation. Jacquard and Dice are equivalent with regard to ranking. That's something to keep in mind. Uh, and then this is maybe a more fundamental point that you'll see recurring throughout this unit. Both L2 norming and also a related calculation, which would just create probability distributions out of the rows, 
They can be useful steps, as we've seen, but they can obscure differences in the amount or strength of evidence that you have, which can in turn have an effect on the reliability of, for example, cosine, norm Euclidean, or KL divergence. Right? These shortcomings might be addressed through weighting schemes, though. But here's the bottom line. There is valuable information in raw frequency. If we abstract away from it, some other information might come to the surface, but we also might lose that important frequency information in distorting the space in that way. And it can be difficult to balance these competing pressures. Finally, I just close with some code snippets. Our, our course repository has lots of handy utilities for doing these distance calculations and also length norming your vectors and so forth. And it also has this function called neighbors in the VSM module. It allows you to pick a target word and supply a vector space model. And then it will give you a full ranking of the entire vocabulary in that vector space with respect to your target word, starting with the ones that are closest. So here are the results for bad using cosine distance in cell 12 and Jacquard distance in cell 13. And I would just like to say that these neighbors don't look especially intuitive to me. It does not look like this analysis is revealing really interesting semantic information. But don't worry, we're gonna correct this. We're gonna to start to massage and stretch and bend our vector space models. And we will see, we will see much better results for these neighbor functions and everything else uh, as we go through that material.